Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. This is the first of our Q&A sessions and we have a couple of questions from our readers here which I'm going to read to you and then we'll talk about them together. So this is the first time I've done a Q&A section like this and I'm hoping that each Saturday I might take some of the questions that are put to us during the course of the week and we'll talk about them together and then I'll post this little video later on YouTube. The first question is a very simple question. It's it's the sort of question that you think sounds so simple and so obvious, but actually um, it's a question that is actually one of the most difficult questions of our times. The question comes from a reader. It says, can God cure unbelief? I'll read that again. Can God cure unbelief? Well, Initially, people might say, well, yes, of course, God can cure unbelief. <laughs> um, and the general assumption is that God can do anything. But, of course, we know that God cannot do anything. He cannot make two by two equal ten. He cannot make a round circle. There's lots of things that the scriptures say that even God cannot do. He cannot deny himself. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. He cannot break his promises. So once we understand that there's lots of things that God can't do, the next thing we've got to ask ourselves is, well, what can he do? What can he do? I mean, can God make people believe? Can he make them believe against their own will? And the answer is no. God has created mankind in such a way and at great risk, okay, at great risk, God has created men in such a way that they are sovereign over their own decisions. And even God himself is unable to override their decisions. And there's lots of scripture all over the way, all over the scriptures, to prove that that's the case. Um, let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, G Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them that were sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered thee, gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. What Christ is saying is, I wanted to help you. I wanted to help you. But you refused it. Somebody might say, well, why doesn't God just help them against their will? Why doesn't he just make them accept him? Because, you see, God has created men in such a way that their will is able to override the will of God. That will is able to override the will of God. You see, the, the sovereignty of God is halted at the will of man. That sounds incredible, doesn't it? If that were not the case, then there never would be sin, would there? You see, God would have overridden the will of man to sin, and he would have caused them to not sin. But of course, even God couldn't do that. He did the greatest risk-taking experiment of all. He allowed man to have a will, even a will that could contradict his own will, and he was actually unable to do anything about that. You see, why was he unable to do anything about that? Well, the Lord Jesus said this on one occasion. He said, I will that all men should be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So the will of God patently is that his will is that all men should be saved. But are they all saved? Well, no, not at all. Why aren't they saved then? How is it that the will of God can be thwarted? How is it that the will of God cannot be fulfilled? It's because he created people with a will of their own. 
He created people that had a will that could defy the will of God. And that means that they were able to say to God, No, I don't want you to believe. I don't want to believe. I don't want to be saved. I want to be damned. Now that is spiritual suicide. But unfortunately, that is the wickedness of the human heart. People um, don't become Christians just because they're convinced of it. People become Christians because they hear the word of the gospel and they believe it and are saved. And that's what God has done. God has done an amazing thing in the church, in the church age. He's brought about a gospel. It is a message that's preached by evangelists. And people who hear it and believe in it and accept it and accept the person of whom the message is speaking, they're saved. But that salvation, it isn't to their credit and it isn't anything of themselves. It is merely to accept that what Christ did is the basis of their salvation. So it's not to their credit and it isn't something that they personally do. What they do is to accept that what Christ did is true. That's the point. And so what God does is when a person hears the gospel and believes in it, God saves the person. And he saves them and he gives them righteousness, even the righteousness of Christ, credited to their account, forgiveness of sins, upon what basis? Simply upon the basis mm -hmm. that they are prepared to believe that Christ has done it all and done it all for them. Mm -hmm. And so that's the wonderful thing about faith. Faith is the only basis upon which a person is saved. They are simply saved on the basis of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In this bit like this in families, isn't it? A bit like this in families. In families, you know, our, our, our children sometimes do things or they say things or they go to places and as parents we wouldn't want them to go. We have more knowledge, we have more wisdom hopefully than the, than the children do. However, though in the early days we may correct them and even prevent them from making mistakes, there comes a time when they have to grow up. There comes a time in which we have to ease off our control and allow them to make their own moral choices and sadly those moral choices are not for the best. But we cannot control them. They have a will of their own and that will must be respected and it's the same with God he doesn't compel anyone to be saved he pleads and he prays and he wishes for them to be saved but he does not compel anybody I'm hoping these questions are going to be helpful let's read another question from a reader was Jesus a wealthy man when he was on earth or was he considered poor well, this is also a difficult question. Difficult in lots of ways. I mean, when we take a look at the, at the, the life of Christ's parents, we discover a number of key phrases. For example, when the angel visited Mary, she described herself as a person of low estate. Now, she could have been referring to her position in society she could have even been using the expression as a token of her humility but certainly she considered herself to be not a person that's a great person in society uh, when Joseph and Mary came to the temple to offer the sacrifice notice what they offered they offered a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons sorry or two young pigeons now these offerings were for the very poorest of the poor however 
After the wise men had come, there must have been an influx of money into the family because the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh were very, very expensive. They were the gifts of the very highest in society. We could call them the gifts of kings, but you see what I mean. And that, that, those gifts no doubt could have been turned into cash to enable them during their time in Egypt to be supported. And of course, when they returned back into Israel later at the death of Herod, when they went to live in Nazareth, that money would have been able to be used to set up the family um, craft business. Um, Sometimes people quote the idea how that the Lord Jesus during his ministry had very little money. They talk about the fact that he had to ask for a penny to be shown to him. But that was probably more likely because he wouldn't have carried around on his person um, coins that had images upon them. Because in the law it was an offence under idolatry laws to carry an image um, we notice also that when the Lord went to the cross, he had a coat that was woven without seam top to bottom. It's assumed again, see these are all assumptions, it's assumed that these were expensive. And that may be the case or not, as the case may be. We're not really 100% sure. So what you're saying is, is there any verse in the Bible that describes the Lord Jesus as being poor? Well, there is. But before I quote it to you, we need to understand that this concept of being poor is quite a relative term. I mean, a person in England or in the USA that's poor may be considered to be a king in other countries that are actually very poor. See the point? So it is a quite a relative thing. But let me give you one scripture. And the scripture says, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Now, whatever that means, we can fairly say, fairly certainly we can say, that the Lord Jesus was poor. And why was he poor? He was poor for you and me. He became poor. Now the question we've got to ask is when was he rich? Well, he was rich in heaven. Before he became a man, he was rich. But in becoming a man, he became poor. So that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Now these are just the first of two questions. We're hoping to have more. Perhaps each Saturday I might do a small Q&A video to answer some of your questions. And I'm looking for your questions. If you have a question, it might be technical. It might be personal. We don't have to mention your name. But we'd, we are looking forward to taking some time to ask, answer some of these, well, some of these difficult questions. Well, God bless you. It's great to talk to you and look forward to seeing you at the next Q&A section next Saturday. God bless you. Bye for now. Bye.